Hello and welcome to this lecture on premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder at learnobgyn.com. Let's start off with a few definitions. Both PMS and PMDD are a combination of both physical and behavioral symptoms that occur in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. PMDD can be seen as a more severe form of PMS that causes more significant dysfunction in the patient's life. I'll be talking about the specific criteria for each of the conditions in the next few slides. PMS is fairly common and can occur in up to 75% of premenopausal women. PMDD is much less common and occurs in about 5% of premenopausal women. Here are the criteria for PMS. Many different bodies have given different criteria for PMS, but since you're prepping for your OBGYN clerkship, we'll be listening to the ACOG criteria for PMS. When a patient experiences her symptoms, they must be occurring within the five days before her menses. That's why they call it pre-menstrual syndrome. Symptoms must occur for at least three menstrual cycles. You can't just have symptoms occur one time and give the diagnosis of PMS. After menses occurs, PMS symptoms must be relieved within four days. And after the relief of symptoms, symptoms can't return until cycle day 13. In other words, they only occur in the luteal phase. Additionally, Symptoms can't be caused by meds, hormone, or alcohol use. One important criteria is that the patient must be suffering social or economic dysfunction. So if a patient's experiencing symptoms but says, hey, it's not bothering me socially or it's not affecting my work, they don't achieve the criteria for PMS. Finally, the patient must have at least one affective symptom and one somatic symptom. So like I just said, the symptoms for PMS are divided into two categories. They're either affective or behavioral symptoms and somatic or physical symptoms. The list of symptoms you see here is in no way comprehensive, but it's just to give you an idea of the common symptoms to look out for. When it comes to affective symptoms, the most common affective symptom is mood swings. Other things to watch out for are depression, angry outbursts, irritability, anxiety, confusion, and social withdrawal. Some somatic symptoms to look out for include breast tenderness, abdominal bloating, headache, and swelling of the arms and legs. So in order to be diagnosed with PMS, you need at least one affective symptom and one somatic symptom. And these symptoms must be causing either social or economic distress. Here are the criteria for PMDD. This criteria is taken from the DSM-5, and the criteria is very similar to that of PMS in terms of timing, and only occurring in the luteal phase and occurring for multiple menstrual cycles. The biggest difference between PMS and PMDD is both the number of symptoms and the type of symptoms. For PMDD, you need at least five of the following symptoms, with at least one of those being from these first four symptoms right here. So these symptoms include feeling depressed or feeling hopelessness, having feelings of anxiety or tension, having a labile mood, so when they're feeling normal one second, and all of a sudden they're feeling extremely sad or in tears, having increased anger, being more irritable, and having more interpersonal conflicts. They can also have decreased interest in activities they used to like, having problems concentrating, lethargy, changes in appetite, sleeping too much or too little, feeling overwhelmed or out of control, and other physical symptoms like bloating or abdominal pain. So if you look at these symptoms, there's two things to take note of. First of all, the majority of these symptoms are affective symptoms. All of these, except for this last one, which is a somatic symptom. Second thing to take note of is that a lot of these symptoms overlap with the symptoms of depression. If you remember from your psych course, the mnemonic for the symptoms of depression is SIG-E-CAPS. This stands for problems with sleep, interest, guilt, energy, concentrating, appetite, psychomotor, and suicidal ideation. Because these two conditions share so many symptoms, it's very important to keep the diagnosis of depression in your differential. And also it's important to keep track of when the symptoms occur in relationship with the menstrual cycle. Let's talk about other conditions you should keep in your differential. Like I just said, you should keep an eye out for other psychiatric disorders, especially depression or generalized anxiety disorder. Patients with these two conditions can have worsening symptoms during the luteal phase. However, unlike PMS and PMDD, they'll have symptoms during their follicular phase as well. If you're having trouble differentiating between depression and PMS, a very useful diagnostic tool is having the patient take a daily log of their symptoms. This will allow you to tell if symptoms are occurring only in the luteal phase and if they've been occurring for multiple menstrual cycles. 
Another thing to look out for is if your patient is premenopausal. As a woman transitions to menopause, they may develop new cyclic anxiety or mood symptoms. This is easier to differentiate from PMS and PMDD because these patients are typically older, usually in their 40s and 50s, as opposed to someone in their early 20s. Also, if you measure their FSH, you'll find their FSH is elevated because they're entering menopause. Another condition that's on most differential lists is if a patient is either hypo or hyperthyroid. If they're having thyroid symptoms, you should do a thyroid panel test to either rule in or rule out thyroid disease. When diagnosing PMS or PMDD, the most important tool is a good history and physical. In particular, you want to get a detailed menstrual history. Ask about the timing of their symptoms, when the symptoms start, when they stop, how severe the symptoms become, and if their symptoms cause any dysfunction in their life. You should find out what meds they're taking, in particular if they're taking any form of oral contraceptive pills. If they are, find out if symptoms started before or after they started this medication. You should also see if they have any thyroid symptoms, either hypo or hypothyroid. On physical exam, you won't find any signs or symptoms of PMS or PMDD. If you get pimped or tested about PMS or PMDD, the most likely question they'll ask you is how you confirm the diagnosis. So this is very important to remember. And the way you do that is with a prospective symptom diary. So with this diary, a patient takes log of their symptoms every day and they'll take log of their symptoms for two months. At the end of the two months, the patient will return the diary to you and you can confirm that they meet the criteria for PMS or PMDD. And since thyroid conditions are on our differential, if you're suspecting any issues with the thyroid, you should measure the patient's serum TSH to see if it's either too high or too low. Now let's talk about the treatment for PMS and PMDD. Both these conditions are treated the same, so it doesn't matter what they present with, you'll start with the same steps. So if your patient only has mild symptoms, in other words, they're not experiencing severe dysfunction from their symptoms, you start off with some lifestyle changes. These include regular exercise and relaxation techniques. The benefit that comes from this treatment is most likely a placebo effect, but since a little more exercise and relaxation has never hurt anyone, these techniques are still recommended for patients with mild symptoms. Some people also suggest the use of supplements, such as vitamin E, calcium, and magnesium. These also provide some benefit, but are most likely due to a placebo effect rather than any real physiologic effect. For patients with moderate or severe symptoms, the first line of treatment are SSRIs. This is another thing you might get pimped or tested on, so it's important to remember. The SSRIs typically used are fluoxetine or sertraline. Once starting a patient on SSRIs, you can get improvement of symptoms as soon as the first cycle. SSRIs could either be given continuously or only during the luteal phase. They are equally effective, but most patients prefer luteal phase only for two reasons. First, you get fewer side effects, and secondly, it's cheaper because you're using fewer pills. If treatment with an SSRI fails, the next thing you'll do is either switch from luteal phase only to continuous, or you'll just try a different SSRI. If that doesn't work either, the third line of treatment are OCPs. These can be either given with a reduced pill-free period, or they can be given continuously. If OCPs fail to reduce symptoms, the fourth line of treatment are GnRH agonists such as lupulide. This works by suppressing LSH and FSH to create a pseudo-menopause state. Although Luprolite does a very good job of treating the symptoms of PMS and PMDD, patients may begin to suffer the symptoms of menopause. This includes hot flashes, reduced bone density, and loss of the cardiovascular protective effect of estrogen. To counteract this, you should give estrogen and progesterone in small doses along with Luprolite. Finally, as a method of last resort, for patients who fail to respond to medical treatment, you can try surgery. This includes removal of both the ovaries as well as a hysterectomy. Again, this should only be used in patients who failed medical treatment and who no longer desire to bear children. Okay, that's all for this lecture on PMS and PMDD. Thank you for listening.